Hello, and welcome to our focus week on urinary tract health. I'm really excited today because I have a special guest, Dr. Linda Loudon, and I met her for the first time at our Naturally Healthy Pets experience in New Jersey. And sometimes you meet someone and you're just like, oh, I like this person. I like talking to this person. I like, like we think very much alike. Um, and so I discovered that Dr. Loudon does emergency medicine, which I, I did emergency medicine for 10 years and I truly loved it. Do you still have a love for it? Oh, I, I do. I love it. And yeah. it is one of those, it's like a type A personality thing where you have to be able to kind of multitask and run around like a chicken without a head and like, you know, figure out what are you going to do first? Because I mean, there were some days where things just, and some nights where things were just flying like, oh, I've got six of them lined up waiting for surgery and I've got, you know, 10 of them that need to get started on their IV fluids and we need lab work and x-rays on everybody. And like, where do you start? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I thrive in that environment. I think Having a little ADHD helps me. <laughs> there you go. I thrived in it when I was younger. So I did it. I started doing it right after I had my my first child. So I was 30 and I did it for 10 years. So that's a really good age span to do it in because you have lots of energy and you're able to run mm -hmm. around like crazy. If I had to go back to it now, I go to bed between eight and nine o'clock at night. So I wouldn't even make the overnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't do overnights. Those I'm, I'm way past those for sure. <laughs> they're 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 tricky. They're tough. And the the worst is I would we had a place to sleep and I would go in, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, things would slow down a little bit, particularly if it was a weeknight. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go see if I can get an hour of sleep. And then I would get into this really deep sleep and one of the technicians would come in and shake me and say, I've got a case here, or, you know, I've already done the the first physical exam, I've got all the the stats for you. Um, you need to come do your exam. Okay. And then I would fall back asleep instantly. <laughs> and then, you know, they'd sit there for five minutes thinking that I was just like working my way into getting up and then they'd poke me again. And I'm like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> and usually it's for like a bloat surge or something where you really have to be awake for it. So sometimes it would take them three or four times to actually get me up and moving. Once I was up, I was fine, but it was just like, no, what? Huh? I remember I, I was in private practice and we had to do our own emergency calls. And one of my clients called me with his Jack Russell that needed a C-section. And it was like three o'clock in the morning. And I was talking to him on the phone about it. And I fell asleep while I was talking to him on the phone. And so he sat there on the other go end going, are you there? Are you there? <laughs> so yeah, oh, tough, tough life. Um, but your other practice that you do in addition is in-home euthanasias, which is such... Yeah. So it's a, it takes a special person to be able to do that. And I think that's one of the things I like about you. Like you just have this, this, um, feel good, soothing, calming personality. And that's exactly what you need oh, for that. You. So, yeah, it's, it's an honor really to be in that room, to be able to have the dog or the, the cat be with their owners in their own bed. And to be in that room filled with love is really an honor that, that I take with me after every case. And so I like to be able to offer that. Yep. And that's exactly the personality that you need to be able to do that. And that's exactly what those pet owners need at that time. So, so we really, yeah. really appreciate people like you who do that. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to move on to our, maybe we'll have you back one week when, and we'll talk about that more in depth. Um, so we want to talk today about urinary stones, so both bladder and kidney stones. And being in emergency medicine, you get to see these cases kind of at their worst, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so what do you see the most? Do you see more cats or more dogs with stone issues? More. Well, stones, I see more dogs. Okay. Um, urinary blockages, I see more cats. Yeah. Yeah, I used to see, I, I had some amazing cases of dogs obstructed with oxalate stones. And the worst one I ever had was about a 115 pound golden retriever. And on x-ray, his bladder looked just like a bag of big sand because they, they were small oxalate stones, but there were thousands and the bladder was just That's full. The hardest. And they were lined up down the entire urethra. Oh, Enti it wasn't like there were a couple causing the black. He mm -hmm. was literally from one end 
to the other. That surgery probably took That's me about a hard one. four hours to dig all those stones out of there. It was yeah, scooping, bad news. Scooping, like, yeah. <laughs> scooping, and then had to do a urethrostomy, and you know, which a urethrostomy is when we make a new hole for them to pee out so that stones don't get stuck in the future uh, in male dogs. So it's kind of a, a big deal. So how often are you having to do surgical repairs in the ER? Because an obstruction is something that it's not like you can say, oh, it's Saturday afternoon, see your bed on Monday. <laughs> yeah, no. And it, it's, it's an, it's emergent and it's so painful. Like, can you imagine like us holding our bladder? I, me- I remember once on my way to a dog show, holding my bladder and to the point of where I had tears running down my face, it hurt oh, no. so bad. Right. <laughs> um, and I'm like, mom, just pull over to the side of the road. I don't care. Imagine these dogs and cats where the amount of pain, because they can be obstructed for hours, days before an owner or guardian realizes it. Yeah. So it is a true emergency. And I would say I see probably one blocked dog a week. Wow. Blocked cats, one a day. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it is a problem. And, you know, in my opinion, like when I got into holistic medicine and my practice changed over from very traditional where the animals were eating traditional kibble based, high carb, low moisture diets. And we started moving over into more species appropriate diets, high moisture diets, the number of blocked cats and dogs with stones dramatically went down dramatically. And I Mm -hmm. think that, um, I think that's where we get into so much trouble when we have these low moisture diets. I think that is a, just a huge problem, particularly cats. They're desert animals. They don't drink very much. Like how do you have a cat? I don't. Not right right now. I I have have nine cats and it is really rare for me to see them go to the water bowl. Like I saw one go to the water bowl the other day and I was like, Huh, that's unusual. Is he okay? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I probably should check. I mean, she's eating great. She's acting great. But uh, it is very unusual for them to drink because they get their moisture from their prey if we're feeding them appropriately. So, but I do see, uh, you know, cats, cats and dogs who are on low moisture diets will definitely hit the water bowl more often. And it's one of the things I get emails all the time from people saying, oh, I changed over from kibble to either a home prepared or a, a raw diet and my dog's not drinking anymore. What do I do? Yes. I can't get them to and drink. like, great. You've achieved <laughs> success. That's great. <laughs> I know. And they're totally freaked out. So yeah. what kind of stones in dogs do you see most commonly? Struvite, I would say, is most common. I, I think that's the most common I see in both, in cats and really? um, dogs. Um, struvite crystals, sorry, in cats, struvite stones in dogs. But calcium oxalates are quite um, common as well. Uh, Interesting. You know, I feel more common than years ago. You know, it was all struvites. And now I feel like it's, you know, oxalates are catching up. They are. And I think that 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 is one of the things that's wrong with prescription diets. First of all, a prescription diet that is a, or a, a veterinary diet. I shouldn't say prescription because one company has the uh, trademark on that, but a veterinary diet um, that you have to get a prescription written for. How about I put it that way? Yeah. (laughs) If they're a dry kibble, that kind of is going against what we're trying to achieve anyway, because we want high moisture diets for these animals with urinary tract problems, because we want things flushing. We want that bladder flushing all the time. So if you have an animal <clears throat> excuse me, who's prone to making crystals or stones. One of the ways that we fight that is flush, 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 flush. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, just- and these, these diets are high in these starchy carbs. These dogs are usually over or cats too, or overweight from these diets, which is another predisposing factor. It goes against so many of the things we're trying to fix exactly. for these cases. Um, I'll still walk into my clinic and blocked cats in the cages and my associates have dry food in there. Um, (laughs) And it it just, it, it, it's common sense. These cats, just because there's a a CD on the the title of the bag doesn't make, make it the right food for that cat. 
So Well, and the thing is, there's no medicine in those diets. They are no. not medicinal. There's no medicine. But what they do put in there very commonly is methionine. Methionine mm-hmm. is an amino acid but it's also a urinary acidifier. And I think that's why we see more oxalates because we put these animals who have had struvites or have had crystals and have had a high pH, and then we put them on an acidifier and we drop their pH to the point where now they want to make oxalate stones. And so we're seeing more oxalate stones. And um, I was always taught, and you can tell me if you learned the same thing, that if you have kidney stones, there's a 99.9% chance they're oxalate stones mm-hmm. in the kidneys. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And have you ever had to remove a kidney stone? I haven't. Me either. I haven't. I've mm-hmm. always referred those um, to clinics that could do lithotripsy or had other options for those owners. Yeah. I, I think I only ever had one patient who actually needed the kidney stone removed. Usually they're just allowed to sit there unless mm-hmm. they're causing an obstruction. And I think I've only ever seen one in 36 years of practice that actually needed to get the stone removed. And now that, like you said, they have better ways to do it where they can use sound waves and other things to help break those stones down and get them to pass. And I've never had a kidney stone, but everybody I've talked to who's had a kidney stone say it's the most painful thing you'll ever go through. Yeah. And I I was thinking about that today in preparation for this. I was just thinking, you know, about kidney stones and people. I've had family members who've had them. And I I wonder if the the pain they're feeling, is it really a kidney stone at that point or is it a ureteral stone, right? Is it in the ureter? Right. Um, I think it's when the, when people are passing them, that's, the, right? yeah. that's, Cause it's that's a very, be t- it's a very, very tiny little tube that doesn't stretch very much. <laughs> yeah. And these are sharp little stones oh in gosh. that little tube from the, the kidney Oxalates to the are ugly. So just think about, you know, something with little spikes on it Mm -hmm. and oh my gosh, they, they just, they grab hold of the lining of the bladder and the lining of the urethra and they, they just scrape it raw. They are are just talking about it. I know they are ugly and they're usually small. Um, The oxalate stones usually don't get very big versus struvite stones. I've seen struvite stones the size of my fist. Yes. Are, those are fun. <laughs> like, as, a the sur- pictures, as a surgeon, not uh, they, the they are fun. As a surgeon, you take them out and you put them on your drape and you're like, it looks like I just went out to the driveway and yeah. scooped up a bucket full of stones. I mean, they're, yeah, they're pretty, they're, they're pretty impressive. So the thing is struvite stones are always caused by a urinary tract infection where the pH goes up, we've got bacteria in there. And those bacteria, when they're doing their bacteria thing, they're releasing substances that cause the urine pH to go up. And then we've got all these red cells and all these white cells and all this debris in there. And then it all coagulates together to make these lovely stones um, with a bunch of minerals. So I, I love struvite stone cases. And this is what one of the things that really just irks me about our profession is an animal that has struvite stones removed and they are dissolvable. Uh, I don't like how we dissolve them. It's with a very restricted diet that they're only supposed to stay on for 30 days. And I've seen animals on that restricted diet for months Forever. and months and months. Yeah. Yeah. And that is bad news so bad. because we are restricting their protein to the point where they, mm-hmm. they don't have enough for their heart to function, for their muscles to function. Like that is bad. It is a 30 day only prescription. And then, and then have you seen these animals? I feel like I always see them for uh, some other chronic disease, right? They've been on these urinary diets their whole life. And then I'm dealing with them with diabetes or Cushing's or something else later on or cancer because they've been on this poor diet and then they're trying to juggle, but I need to be on this urine diet, but he's diabetic. Get him off of the urine diet. But they, they're so, it's so ingrained. It's so ingrained. And that's one of the things that just make me crazy because a prescription is something that is used for short term. And then you reevaluate and do I need to stay on this? And I, the same thing happens in human medicine. People get like, my husband questioned one of his medications the other day and I said, well, how long have you been on that? He said, I don't know, eight or nine years. Oh, since, um, since he turned, five years. And I said, well, why are you on it? He, he didn't know. <laughs> and I said, well, hasn't anybody reevaluated the medications? <laughs> so we just got a concierge doctor. And I'm like, so 
can we figure out why he's on this and does he need to keep taking it? And it's just, it's like, it just, it just happens in human medicine yeah. and in veterinary medicine. But the, so struvite stones are secondary to bacterial infection. So we get rid of the stones, we clear up the fact, the infection, we get a negative culture and we've cleared up whatever was causing it. So whether, you know, it's a, a an animal that's urinating too low to the ground, or they've got a genetic defect, you know, with a tucked vulva, whatever is causing them to get an infection. So we figure that out, we treat it, and then all we do is monitor their urine and make sure they don't have infection. And if they have mm -hmm. infection, then we treat it and we don't make stones. It's when the infections go on for months and months and months. And it's amazing how many dogs in particular have urinary tract infections with zero symptoms. Yes, which is so important. Like just going in for yearly blood work, make sure urine is getting done. Exactly. My my husband's a general practitioner vet and he came home last night and he's like, guess how many UTIs I saw today because it snowed. Exactly. And I was just right? going to say, we always diagnose them in January, February when it snows and the dog goes outside and pees and the owners mm -hmm. are like, oh my gosh, there's blood in the urine or there's blood clots. Exactly. And I mean, I've even had owners who come in and say, here's the picture of what he peed out. There's a bunch of stones in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, but that is when it snows, the urinary tract infections come flying through the door because now people know about it. And I actually had a dog, it was adopted by one of my really, really good clients and good friends, this little Maltese. And the dog had incontinence and we kept doing urinalysis on the dogs and they were perfectly clear. Like there, no problem at all with this dog's urine. And then the dog did something orthopedic and she went to my friend, the orthopedist, to have a discussion about orthopedic surgery and they x-rayed the dog and found out that she had all these spinal malformations and she also had a bladder filled with struvite stones. Oh, wow. Completely clean urinalysis, no symptoms other than leaking urine sometimes. And I was blown away. That's, I was like, I'm so surprising. sorry we didn't diagnose that. <laughs> That's really surprising, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes it happens. I had a um, another one. It came in for seborrhea, bad skin, greasy skin. And um, we ended up, you know, I was, did a workup on the dog, and we ended up taking x-rays, and the dog had a bladder full of stones. Owner had no clue. I had no clue. And so it's like, oh, you came in for a skin infection. You're going out with a need for bladder surgery. Sorry. Yeah, yeah and that's <laughs> common. I mean, that is common. You know, the fact that you kept checking that urine and it was normal is uncommon, but urines aren't checked enough in general. No. And no. so when I, I, it is very common that I'm doing x-rays all the time in the ER that I will find, incidentally, your dog also has stones. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but we're we're going to fix his laceration, but. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we might want to fix something else while we're at it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredibly common. And, you know, I used to have. Because I'm a Cavalier lover, I would get a lot of people bringing their Cavaliers, particularly once they developed a heart murmur or, you know, something else was, you know, Cavalier disease was, was mm -hmm. occurring with their dogs. And I remember I had this one woman who drove a couple hours to get to me with her dog. And when I saw the dog, it was just like, okay, well, yes, he has heart disease. Yes, he has SM. Yes, he has CM. Yes, he has luxating patellas. And... I said, well, okay, we got to do a workup on the dog. And I said, we needed a urine sample. And she said, how do I do that? I've never, the dog's 12 years old. She said, I've never been asked to get a urine sample on my dog. I'm like, in 12 years, your veterinarian never told you to get wow. a urine sample. And I find that to be really common. Mm -hmm. And I, I get lab results to review all the time. And, and, you know, does my dog have kidney disease? I don't know. You didn't give me a urine sample. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yes. So critically, critically, critically important. But remember that you can, you know, if your dog has symptoms, if they're straining, if they're asking to go out frequently, if they're producing small amounts of urine at a time, uh, you definitely need to check a urine sample. But there's a good chance you might want to get some x-rays or an ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah. And especially those recurring UTIs. I see them all the time where a general practitioner will just keep putting them in on antibiotics. And, yes. and that'll happen either there's something exterior that hasn't been fixed, like a recessed vulva, like you, you spoke about, something that's predisposing them. It's never been cultured. The urine needs to be cultured. 
You need yes. to know what bacteria you're you're treating so that you clear it up. You need to recheck that urine to know that you cleared it up. Exactly. And then look for another secondary cause. If it keeps happening, check that x-ray for stones. Because you keep treating these dogs with uh, antibiotics, you're you're messing up their gut biome, you're messing up their overall health. And And you're developing antibiotic resistance. Exactly. Yeah. So then you, you end up with, oh, okay, we finally found stones after seven rounds of antibiotics. Oh, look, we have stones because we never cleared up the urinary tract infection. Now we've got to deal with that. And now we're culturing something that is going to require killer antibiotics or there are no antibiotics that will take care of it, which is a huge yeah. issue. It really is. It really is. And then the owners are upset with the ER doctor for spending so much money, right? <laughs> exactly. But- <laughs> Throwing antibiotics is not fixing your dog. No. And the thing is, another thing, antibiotics are expensive. So if you, especially if you have a big dog, you might have just spent $200 on a prescription that isn't going to do do anything. It's not going to work. Right. And the other thing that I'm seeing more and more of is people are not going for tradition. The veterinarians are not reaching for the traditional antibiotics. First, first line, they're going for these super powered ones Mm -hmm. that we are supposed to be reserving for things that are resistant. And so that can be a huge issue as well. And, you know, the big problem is you've got an animal who's peeing blood clearly they've got something going on and you want to give them something to try to fix the problem immediately. And it takes a few days to get that culture back. So I kind of understand, like, I want to give them something to make them more comfortable immediately. Um, Do you have something that you reach for if you want to wait for that culture to come back just to try to make them more comfortable? Um, You know, honestly, I'll go with an antibiotic that is a broad spectrum antibiotic like a clavamox that covers most of our UTIs that we see. Um, I'll look at the dog's pH and I'll look at the, the, we do a urinalysis in house. So I'll have a good idea of what I'm dealing with. Right. Um, I'll have a good idea of what bacteria I'm up against while I wait for the culture. I'll work on that pH so that we're, you know, if it is struvites, we can get acidify the urine. Right. And uh, I will put them on a clavamox for, uh, you know, the three to four days that I'm waiting for the culture. I'm not going to grab the Batril or right. something right. like that. And, that, and, and that's warranted. what I'm seeing, unfortunately. It's uh, here's your here's your Batril, here's you know, thoroquinolones, um, ciprofloxacin, and things like that. And that should not be our first line. So, yeah. you know, other things that, that we can do, we can get them to start using d which is yeah. a great, great um, antibacterial soothing Especially cranberry supplements. E. coli, right? Exactly. Cranberry supplements, particularly with E. coli, um, but even marshmallow root just to calm down that bladder. It's a lot of things that uh, people can do for cats. Glucosamine is actually one of the the best things to soothe the bladder. And then just for cystitis in general, the the PEA, the palmitoyl ethanolamide has been studied a lot for interstitial cystitis in people. Um, And we found that it's pretty helpful for for calming down that inflammation that's going on. So, I, you know, the big key with stones is preventing the formation is, yeah. is really the goal. So once you have an animal with stones, you don't want to end up in, I mean, Dr. Loudon is a very nice woman and I'm sure you'd love to meet her, <laughs> but you really don't want to meet her with your dog or cat with stones in the bladder needing surgery. It's not going to be cheap. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's not cheap. And it's, it's so much for your dog to go through. You know, it's the pain of being blocked and then having to go through surgery and recovery if you can avoid it, you know, and a lot of these predisposing factors is if a dog's, you know, holding their urine too long, you know, you don't want your dog going hours and hours throughout the day, not having the ability to urinate because that's going to give them a more concentrated urine. Um, You know, I'll, I'll even hear of owners who hold their water because they want, you know, they don't want them to pee. Well, that's going to concentrate their urine. You're, you're making a nice home for that bacteria and those stones to develop. Good and point. so um, you really need to hydrate, hydrate your dogs with that 
hydrating diet, not a dehydrating diet, like a <laughs> processed kibble that's got these starchy carbs in it that are just setting, you know, setting them up for chronic diseases and stone formation. Yep. Same with our kitty cats because they're not big drinkers. And so, I mean, I see, yeah. I, I used to see urine specific gravities on cats that the, the spectrophotometer only goes up to 1.070 and yeah. they're above that. And it's like, oh my gosh, that that's like the desert. <laughs> that yes, is it's so like the, dry. <laughs> yeah. And it's a perfect place for stones to develop you exactly. know, in that concentrated urine. And, and the specific gravity and the pH, those are two really good parameters to monitor your cat and your dog after an episode or you find out they might have crystals or stones. And it's so easy to do. I mean, anybody can get the urine strips and test them at home and yeah. see where you are. So it's a, it's a, and so I would, I would say that anyone who has ever had a cat or a dog with urinary crystals or urinary stones in particular, uh, cause you don't want to go through that more than once. I had one client, God bless her, wonderful woman. Uh, her dog had stones every single year. And the dog was on the best diet and we did everything and it would flip back and forth. It would develop oxalates and then it would develop struvites and then it would develop oh, oxalates wow. and then it would develop struvites. Like rough. this dog, oh, she just was so difficult. And so she had surgery the first few years and then the specialty center got lithotripsy and had other ways of dealing. So she ended up having some better ways to deal with it, but we could not figure out why this dog just wanted to do this every mm. year and god bless her she she stayed on top of it. the dog is doing great um and she oh gosh she's got to be early teens maybe by now but the poor thing i mean it's just all the That's time a lot i know thank goodness so some, she found an owner who would take care of her you know? oh my gosh this owner is amazing um but it's it's you know sometimes we struggle to get to the bottom of what's causing the issue, but you want to do everything you can and then keep them on a diet that is going to support them the best possible. Uh, try not to end up in the, in the ER because it's not the best, you know, when you're at the ER and your animal is blocked and you're freaking out and there's a, you know, if the, if it's a surgical problem, you've got general anesthesia, you've got staying in the hospital, you've got potential kidney damage. If they're blocked for more than 24 to 48 hours, it's damaging the kidneys. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't want them to develop stones and we don't want yeah. them to develop blockages for sure. For sure. Yeah. And the, the kidneys and the cats, we find, you know, they, they, they will come back pretty quickly with diuresis and the IV fluids. But, you know, when we get the, these cats in that have gone 24, 48 hours without urinating, other things are going on, metabolic derangements, you know. Potassium levels get high, arrhythmias. which can stop the heart. So we've got everything. Yeah, so many and, things and, can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and when those cats are, you know, you get those potassiums over 10, you know, some of those cats aren't going to make it because you just waited too long. And what an agonizing way to go. You know, yeah, really so you've got to catch it. Th that abnormal vocalization when they're in the litter box or urinating outside of the litter box. Or straining. Um, it's funny. Uh, we used to get so many phone calls and, you know, especially if we had a new receptionist on and they'd come back and say, this lady's on the phone or her cat is constipated. It's straining and she mm -hmm. wants to know what to give it for constipation. And I'm like, she's going to give Bring it a car it ride here right <laughs> <Yes>. now. <laughs> yeah, we get that a lot. The mix up of whether it's constipated or or a yep. urinary issue and yeah. it's better to be safe than sorry. And I was going to say, out. if in doubt, take your cat in because a blocked cat is a big deal. And the longer they're blocked, the worse the prognosis, the worse the chances for uh, full yeah. recovery. So, um, and when we were talking about struvites, the cats, that's usually a sterile cystitis. Right? Yeah. The cats is usually a not a bacterial problem. Theirs is just a lot of inflammation and crystals because their urine is too concentrated. And then the crystals are irritating to the bladder lining. So it wants to make a mucus covering to protect itself. And then all of that just kind of congeals together. And there you have it, a cork. Yeah. And that, that urethral opening in cats is so tiny. It's just set up for failure. 
Exactly. Um, <laughs> they don't have a good chance. But one thing I see and important for feline owners to know is that in the ER, I see cats all the time come into me. They went to see their vet on Thursday because their cat was showing lower urinary tract signs. They went in, they just got a convenient injection and which went is an home. Antibiotic. Which is an antibiotic, a long acting antibiotic, which I don't like using. But they get that and they go home. Now, this is a sterile problem. We're not treating anything. We're, right. So now we're causing more issues in this cat. And inevitably, I will see him two days later in the ER block where he might have, we might have caught it two days earlier if we had started some therapies, worked on the pH, get some remedies fluids. going, <laughs> get some fluids, you know, get him, you know, talk to the owner about diet and, and, and treat his pain and his anxiety because stress is a big factor for cats in this yep. syndrome. Um, so if, if you you think your cat has a lower urinary tract issue and it's a male and your vet wants to give a convenient injection, I would say no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cause most of them are sterile. Unless, so the, the, the antibiotic is not doing anything to help the kitty cat. So not at all. That's very true. Good point. Well, thank you very much for having this thank chat you. with me. It is greatly it appreciated. Lovely. And uh, we'll definitely talk some more later. So everyone, if you have animals with urinary tract issues in the past, please watch our full week of uh, interviews and talks because we've got a ton of information. Thank you very much, Dr. Loudon. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.